And when SSH went commercial, they changed the license. Uh, a couple people noticed that SSH 1.2.12 was under the, the last version under a BSD license and said, you know, I bet we could take that code and bring it up to modern standards. And they did a huge amount of work on that. Uh, they did a good enough job that they actually uh, had to fend off trademark complaints from commercial SSH. Uh, and new features in SSH actually hit OpenBSD first, and then a couple other people extract OpenSSH uh, from OpenBSD. They put some portability glue around it, and they release the SSH that you have on Linux and Solaris and everywhere else. Um, for the record, the OpenBSD guys would really, really like to see a good competing SSH implementation. Because it is not good for any one piece of software to have 90% market share. Um, so if you're looking for a, pro a project to really make yourself known at, take this on. So, OpenBSD is also highly portable. Um, how many of you have a VAX in your basement? <laughs> yes, sir. I said there are some. It runs on Open OpenBSD runs on it. How many of you don't know what a VAX is? Okay, computer from the 1980s, uh, used well, at a lot of universities. They were DEC. Uh, DEC made them. Uh, DEC bought whoever it was that made VAX, I believe, but. Uh, that developed that, that was their own. Wasn't it? You know, I forget I'm not anymore. Sure I, they did. I haven't. That's yeah, interesting. Just, the PDP 8 and PDP 11 and the VAC superseded it. Back, Thank back, you, sir. What? VAC sort of cracked the market be, because before then, everybody who came out with a new, every company that came out with a new, faster computer wrote a new operating system for it. VAX right. was, I believe, the first one to use the same operating system across a wide, wide range of, uh, of hardwares. Well, that VAX was very good hardware. Some of it still runs today. Yeah. Why is this important? Well, one, <coughs> porting to multiple platforms makes sure that your code is portable. And two, a lot of people do their development on a nice, fast AMD64 machine. If they make a change that adds a tiny bit of overhead, uh, you're not going to notice it on the AMD64 machine. But the guys who are running VAX will go, uh, excuse me, <laughs> yeah, it's, you just host performance. So all of this, things like network stack randomization, they work on a VAX. This, there, there's, there is overhead, but it runs on hardware from 1970 something, 1980 something, and that hardware is usable, so shut up. <laughs> and another thing that's interesting is they never cross compile. A lot of people who support multiple hardware platforms will they actually build the code on a you know a 24 core AMD 64 machine and install it on the VAX. No. Their releases are actually their VAX release is built on a VAX because this is a validation that the code actually works, that the operating system is self-hosting. Zorus. Sharp Zorus. Zorus, yes. Tiny little <laughs> device. For a long time, it was the the only way to get handheld SSH. You could. Uh, uh, it had a thumb-based keyboard. I, I had two. Oh, you, oh, you have two. You can run OpenBSD on it, and people use them today. So, uh, you can customize OpenBSD. They have, they have thousands of add-on software packages. Most of it is compiled with the 
most common options. You want to set up an Apache PHP server here, fine. <coughs> if you want something kind of exotic, you know, you want Emacs built with the Athena toolkit. Mm -hmm. uh, they make it very easy to build it yourself, but they're not going to bother to build it. One of the nice things about OpenBSD is the PF packet filter. Um, how many of you have used IP tables? <laughs> I have used IP tables. Um, I've used it a great deal, and therefore I feel quite confident in saying that I really hate it. Mm -hmm. This is a configuration file for PF. Don't allow anything in. Pass in on our network interface from anything on the local network. Pass in from anywhere else on these three ports. And send anything out. You can look at this and, and even not knowing much about PF, you can have a pretty good idea what this rule set does. I would have expected the block to be on the bottom. It is last match. Uh, and that is a... Does the packet filter also do things like masquerading and... Oh, yes. Yes, you have masquerading. It does bandwidth control. Um, everything you need to build a, a very solid network mingling device. Um, you can also do much more complex things. Now, define a table of the hosts that uh, you want to treat specially. Set up macros for various things in your rule set. So you don't want to, uh, if your external interface is VR0, you don't want to change your network card and have to go do a search and replace on your firewall rule set because something's going to go wrong. Uh, especially if your interfaces are named something like eat zero colon something. Uh, search and replace goes very wrong very quickly. So you can define which interfaces you want to treat in which way. You can define which addresses, which ports. So uh, instead of having a bunch of rules that say from each of these addresses, you see our second line there that just says pass in from our management hosts. You get a new subnet that will have that has something important on it. You add it to one list of addresses and it percolates through the entire rules. Uh, the, the equivalent in IP tables is a little longer and at least in my opinion harder to read. This resembles English. So you can alter those tables at the command line. You can add dynamic rules at a command line if you want. Uh, the trick is you define a place in the rules that says, here is an anchor, a named label, where you may add rules. So instead of just you know, running a command line and tagging it wherever you want, the filter says, no, you may add rules here and here. And this retains your uh, strict processing of your firewall rules. So, some other things. Uh, all the hardware sensors, uh, all of that IPMI related stuff works, uh, spills its guts out for you. Tmux lets you run multiple windows in one window. It's much like screen, except uh, how many of you have used the screen? Well, screen includes features like uh, a serial line client, which I'm, I'm sure there is a perfectly good reason for it, but these kinds of features make screen much larger and much more complicated. Tmux is just 
a terminal multiplexer. Uh, the CWM window manager, I think, is wonderful. Uh, the swap. How many of you have, have run into the encrypted swap problem? If you encrypt your entire swap space so that nobody can read it, but you use one key for the entire space, anything written to swap can stay there for years. Depending on how your program is written, this may include your passwords. So OpenBSD doesn't have one giant swap space that it encrypts. It has one swap space with a whole bunch of tiny encrypted swaps, each with its own key. And when it's done with a piece of swap, it throws away the key for that piece. Uh, all kinds of fun routing stuff. And of course, clothing. <laughs> um, you may have seen a lot of OpenBSD clothing around conferences and such. And there's actually a pretty good reason for that. Uh, OpenBSD has no corporate backer. All of their development is funded entirely by the sale of CD sets, uh, t-shirts, related stuff. Um, you can buy two of my books through the OpenBSD project, and the proceeds go to them. And of course, uh, they take donations. They will happily take your money. So. It is a quarter to eight. I have till what? Uh, eight. Eight-ish is okay? Okay. I'm going to try to go through this. This is the current OpenBSD memory randomization project. The 2038-ish. How many of you hope to be retired by 2038? Okay. This has a huge impact on you. Um, because of system lifespans, the, the electrical controls in Detroit are 40 years old, which is sadly not that uncommon. Um, Toronto is not far from here, and, and their uh, can-do nuclear plant, lovely name. It's run by a PD, was run by a PDP-11 for many years. It finally died. They replaced it with a modern PC running a PDP-11 <laughs> emulator. <laughs> <laughs> this is what, 200 miles from here? <laughs> yeah, fortunately the wind usually blows that <laughs> Um But we have nuclear reactors west of here. Um, what about medical devices? Wind River sells Linux for medical devices. I would not be shocked to discover in the year 2038 that I had a pacemaker. And I do not want it to have 32-bit time. Thank you. <laughs> well, am I going to get a call in, you know, uh, Late December 2037, saying, uh, we need you to come in for an operation now. No, no. You're on a waiting list. You're, you're on a waiting list. Uh, but just come to the waiting room and, you know, first come, first serve to have your BIOS flash. <laughs> uh, at that point, you know, I would just about have a heart attack, except, for, of course, I couldn't. <laughs> So, um, there are solutions. They've invented a, a time 64T, but nobody uses it. And adding this new API won't fix all the old code. Um, it's the same, you know, Microsoft never su stopped supporting old APIs. Uh, Linux has the overwhelming majority of old APIs. I know they've pulled a few, but for the most part, old code actually works. And there are other things, there are games you can play with signed versus unsigned. Mm -hmm. um, that all gets really ugly really fast, and lots of stuff will break. And if you're going to break it anyway, let's break it properly. We could say, okay, world, the world will be on 64-bit hardware by then. 
Um, and the answer is no. Embedded manufacturers are not going to switch to 64-bit hardware until 32-bit is no longer made. The power requirements are much higher. System requirements much higher, much more heat. And 32-bit hardware will continue to be made until embedded manufacturers stop buying it. Okay. We could say, yes, there is a forward migration path. Anyone remember large, the Large File Summit? Uh, they wanted, back in 92, all the Unix guys got together and said, we need to support fire files larger than two gigabytes. Here's our forward migration path. <coughs> and this will support files up to 128 gigs. And eventually people will stop doing, everybody will have migrated forward, and you will no longer need to define dash D large file source. Compile some software sometime. Look at what scrolls past. And you will to this day see a majority of software saying define this flag. Okay. Forward migration isn't. If you have a bright idea on solving the 2038 issue, try it, document it. Present it at a conference. Save us all, please. <laughs> <laughs> OpenBSD is going is redefining time t as long long. This will end this problem. It will no longer be an issue during the life of our universe. Anyone who wants to port OpenBSD into the next universe, uh, I suggest you reset the epoch and don't worry about backwards compatibility. <laughs> so, they've done this on all the platforms. Stuff is breaking. It's kind of cool. Um, bug reports are being filed because in theory, in theory, the software should just take it and compile, and we all know that it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> people are reporting bugs, but OpenBSD will ship with long, long time T. And they are using their position as a pressure point to drag everybody else forward with them. You know, people have tried things like this before. FreeBSD and Linux have long time TN 64-bit hardware. NetBSD went to long, long time T everywhere, but they didn't do any work on engaging the outside world that things are crashing. And sadly, that's, you know, the OpenBS, sorry, the NetBSD folks are not that involved in the outside world. So what's the difference between long time T and long, long time T? It varies by platform. Long, long does also, or? I believe so. There are probably people here capable of giving a much better answer than I can. But a 32-bit CPU, long, long would be 64 bits? Yes. And Is long, long, 128-bit in places? In places. There's, uh, like a U64, there's a, a several different types of other defines I deal with embedded because I have to port between 16 and 32 bit whatever. Sure. Short, long, 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 whatever is different everywhere. Yeah. Um, as, as bad as when the Linux had to go to the alpha where the pointers were 64 bits and the integers were not. Um, but the idea is there's usually a portability library and everybody does a little bit differently, but if you need a bit size, there's a particular include, I don't remember what it is, but I think it's probably like U32, U64, U16 or whatever, and then that type depths it to either long, 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 short, or unsigned car as Whatever cars are not necessarily eight bits either. Right? <laughs> no. That's another thing. But um, the, there's when I say long, long or long time t. Well, time t is the type depth thing that should be 64 bits. Time t will now in 5.5 will now be um, 
type depth to a unsigned 64-bit integer by what whatever include magic for the architecture that you don't want to see. So it's not whether it's long, long, or whatever. It, it, the time T's type depth was 32-bit. Unsigned 32-bit, now it's going to be unsigned 64-bit. Thank you. Thank you. I knew I didn't have to prepare that. Someone would <laughs> fill it for me. So, yes, sir. Will that compile on Azorus? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, it will. It will compile everywhere. And I mean, that could be the right run pass. It will actually. I can guarantee you that the Vax users will be checking. <laughs> so. By doing this, OpenBSD is, yes, they're leaning on third parties, but they're also saying, hey, here's our code. Here are all kinds of ways to fix this in your code. And it will drag the world forward, whether it likes it or not. Yes, sir? So it seems like, well, OK, you guys will prop, and OpenBSD may never be the world's most popular. Yep. Operating system, but given, but it seems like one real value would have is that if I'm a software vendor and I can say my software compiles and runs on OpenBSD, then no matter what pro, no matter what um, platform you do run on, there are whole classes of programs that we can kind of promise you you will not have. Yes. And that could be very valuable to the Yes. If you run on OpenBSD and you run correctly. That is an acid test to say, we do not have these classes of problems. Uh, How many BSDs are there? You've mentioned yes. open, free, and that. <laughs> um, okay, the, the big BSDs, I'm going to answer that in just a second because this is the last slide. Okay. OpenBSD.org. Go there. Try it out. Um, I have books there. Here, you can buy some of them. There. Uh, this trip, the gas is now tax deductible. Um, how many BSDs are there? How much time have we got? 7.55. Okay. Uh, there are four major BSDs. Uh, FreeBSD, OpenBSD, NetBSD, and then Dragonfly, which is a... Uh, uh, FreeBSD is focused on the most popular hardware, OpenBSD, uh, on all the stuff I just babbled about. NetBSD's main goal is portability. Dragonfly it has some radical reimaginings of the operating system. And their end goal is to run as a single system image across multiple pieces of commodity hardware. Is it that again? It's for no, it system. is not ready yet. However, their, uh, their multiprocessor support now runs completely lockless. which is a, a major stepping stone towards that. I don't know if they'll succeed, but it's really kind of cool to watch, and I'm, I'm glad someone's being really ambitious. What would be the advantage of that? You have a room full of 100 PCs, and they have one operating, operating system instance. They're all running all of the cores on all of those machines are coordinated as one operating system. Isn't that kind of what Google does? It's like what Google does, um, except they use a, an array of Linux systems, and their software is written to cooperate between OSs. Um, the Dragonfly goal is USSH into one machine. And you're actually administering all of them because the same OS instance is running on all of the nodes. You call a pointer in your code, it might be on that node, or on that node, or on that node. 
one memory space. What kind of note? Do all you BSD guys <coughs> get along? Do you play together well? Yes and no. <laughs> it's like football. If you get a bunch of if you get a bunch of football fans in the same room, you know, someone says, Well, I'm a Packers fan and the Packers are awesome. And someone else will say I'm gonna take oh, you no. out back. Sorry? So I'm gonna take you out back? <laughs> Perhaps. And someone will say, No, Steelers all the way, and someone holds up a hand and says, Detroit Lions, and everybody goes, Ha ha ha. Um but uh, among the people who are really in the communities, yeah, they get along. I mean, at least we're not golf. <laughs> oh, oh, hey, d don't go dissing hockey. <laughs> That's uh, Canadian. Speaking of which, OS 10 uh, Darwin. Uh... Oh, yes. OS 10 is uh, the user land is BSD based. And what is the relative size of, of these? Uh, is well, one 90% and the other small, or are they rough? Uh, FreeBSD has the largest user base because they actually try to recruit people. They, they do things like promotion. Um, OpenBSD is second. There, there is a certain charm in moral absolutes. Say, no, we will. You know, stick two fingers in Cisco's eyes because it is the right thing to do. And that's, you know, they're kind of like, OpenBSD is like the Richard Stallman of the BSD world. That's, this is how you do it. This is the right way. This is the right way, and if you don't like it, go go play with Windows or something. Just, but, you get them you go to a conference with a heavy BSD contingent. Go to the nearest bar with a decent selection, and you will find them there, buying each other drinks and debating the fine points of this or that type of architecture. And how much commonality is there in the code? Then? Uh, we steal from each other blatantly Blatant. and liberally. <laughs> a code <coughs> may originate in one project, migrate to another, be improved in a third, and stolen back to the original. We're, it's all under the same license. We, we really have no, I don't want to say pride of ownership. There, there's, if someone has a good idea, we'll take it. Why choose one over the other then? What are your goals? Security. If, if you're looking for what OpenBSD offers, uh, I use FreeBSD and OpenBSD. Each has a, a, a separate place, and to be honest, each has its own annoying peculiarities. Um, you know, OpenBSD I'll use mostly for uh, packet filter, routing, um, I'll also use it for a highly secure system like uh, my Ansible system runs OpenBSD uh, because that is a, a key point for systems administration. Ansible is like puppet or chef. I don't want anyone getting into that. It's OpenBSD. If I want to run a whole bunch of you know, Apache modules and such and just make it pretty easy, I'll use FreeBSD. Yeah, what about the Linux util well, Linux, not Linux, the utilities that would be things like uh, move and copy and uh, it's they're not GNU Linux. No, they're not. And is it possible to get the GNU utilities? Oh yes. Um there is a core utils port. And there is even a script that will do a bunch of aliases for you and say here, put this in your dot CSHRC or .shrc. Um, the, the, mo the thing I find most annoying switching from one to the other are the flags to PS. <laughs> yeah. Because back when POSIX was first defined, a lot of us were saying, 
hallelujah. Someone will finally have to sit down and say, is it PS minus AX or PS minus EAF? I don't care which, just pick one. <laughs> and the standard came out and said, you may use either. <laughs>